Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a long day for you, so I hope you have some energy to listen to me for at least half an hour or so. Um, also, we're changing the tune of your talk, the talks. Most of it has been about application of technology in our improving our life. And I will talk a little more about how to improve our mind in terms of at least what science has to say about who we are and what is our place in this world, in this universe. So I'd like to give you a synopsis so that you know where I'm going. Basically, I want to point out to you that uh, after contribution from many scientists, both theoretical and experimentalist. Now we have a pretty good idea for the first time about who we are, what is our place in this cosmos, how this could be utilized in improving our quality of life. And uh, so all of this has been possible with a series of paradigm changes in experimental discovery as well as theoretical analysis of those experiments and predicting something. So I will not go into too much into the scientific part, but um, at least I'd like to give you an example or some idea that we are not just talking about nonsense, everything is pretty much tied down in terms of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So, probably most human being, as, as we have been able to uh, think, then, you know, we can trace our genealogy back to the first Homo habilis that, ha that came around two and a half million years ago. And then we can actually trace our ancestry back to probably a single bacteria. But um, humans are the only one that has been able to think about not only who we are, but this question must have arisen in your li life <coughs> at one time or another. But um, only answer we had before was either through religion or philosophy, uh, both have some problem. Religion professes that the knowledge has been given, you shall not question. And so religion and re regular religion and science really do not agree in that. Because science is open-ended. The first thing in science is that you shall question. And philosophers always have been trying to answer they give good arguments on one side, equally good arguments on the other side. So you don't know which one is actually true. But in science, there's a gold standard of experiment. If the experiment says this is true, which anybody can verify, then we accept it. So all of these experiments, as well as theoretical um, intuition, like Einstein was not an experimentalist, but in his intuition is, it really has made is at the basis of most of the uh, things that I'll be talking to you about. So, in terms of what, what do we come from? Well, as far as we have been able to think, at the beginning way back, about two millennia, two millennia ago, democracy has thought that everything is made of atoms, which are not divisible. But that idea fell on the wayside because Aristotle didn't like the idea. And, but two, about 200 years ago, Democritus' idea was revived by English chemist John Dalton. But still, he thought the atoms are not divisible. But then, towards the end of 19th century, almost the last decade, uh, uh, last few years, few things happened that really 
showed us that different paradigm exists. Atom is divisible. First, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, which is a negatively charged particle, and also radioactivity was discovered, which means that atom is not stable, it's giving out radiation. And of course, all of these came together with Max Planck's idea of the quantum, that uh, energy that we are all are made of, everything is made of, comes in bundles, a quantum. Quantum means quanta, how much? A bundle, not, not continuous, discrete amount. Like for instance, electron is a bundle of energy, but it's not what uh, we have been conditioned to think as a particle. Like we always present this, uh, by the way, I'm not advertising my book, but if you want to, I'm covering a vast subject, so if you want to know a little bit more about details, you'll find in this book, uh, Codename God, uh, has been going on since 2005, and uh, is still uh, quite popular. And uh, uh, so uh, what I'm talking, pretty much it in, in, encapsulated in this book. So what we look at is a cartoon picture, so to speak, essentially. Uh, See, so talked about the atoms, everything is atoms, but then now we found the electrons, electrons going around the <coughs> nucleus. But here we're showing electrons, a little tiny marble ball particle. They, we realized that is not true because positive, positive and negative charge attract each other. So electron eventually fall into the atom, atom will be destroyed. How is it that the atom is stable? That was a big puzzle. What he found that electron is not really a particle. It is actually a wave, packet of web of energy. And uh, let me see. Um, I'm going go ahead a little bit more. What I was trying to give you an idea of we have built many big large machines and this is the largest one uh, to, to find out more about the uh, experimental uh, uh, verification of the experimental results and the theory and uh, this is a 27 kilometer tunnel in Geneva European Center for Research the, uh, uh, it's called uh, CERN, Center for European uh, uh, Nuclear Research. And inside this tunnel, you'll see these uh, uh, magnets. And there actually, you create the coldest temperature in the, uh, on the universe, more than the temperature of the uh, empty space. And also when they collide, the, these particles collide, they create the hottest temperature up to trillion degrees uh, uh, and where the particles are detected. Why do you do that? Because uh, when you want to look at something in with your, uh, what, what is made of, usually with a microscope, but the highest resolution microscope uses electrons, electron microscope. And, but that can only go up to about the uh, level of the atoms. If you want to go deeper, there is no microscope. But fortunately, physics at higher temperature is equivalent to physics at lower dimension, fundamentally lower dimension. So instead of microscope, that's so this particle physics accelerator actually is a mic physicist microscope because creating higher temperature, we try to study what would happen as you go down and down uh, towards the fabric of space. And these are uh, come, uh, these are detected by these giant detectors about five story high. This is called one of the detectors, CMS detector, and part of it was built at the University of California where I am in, uh, uh, doing my research now. 
So I just wanted to give you one idea that there are many machines like this have been built, but this happens to be the largest. And uh, this is where the latest uh, particle called Higgs boson was discovered. And uh, that uh, was uh, probably one of the most important things that we were missing for 40 years. Finally, we found it there. And uh, so this is how we get into this uh, inside this uh, pro here, this uh, one proton is here. And uh, these protons are made up of uh, quarks, the quarks and, and gluons. And uh, also there are some neutral particles called uh, neutrons. So this, the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and they are very tiny, 10 to the minus 14 meter, like 10 to the minus uh, 12 centimeter. And the quarks are even smaller, about 10 to the power minus uh, 16 centimeter. But with these big machines, we have been able to find their properties. And uh, 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 so essentially what we're doing here we're getting uh, not only how the micro, uh, micro sphere of the universe works, you go down and down to, to the fabric of space. We, uh, we can study with these instruments. Also, it gives some clue about the, large of the largest of the large, the universe. The universe is the largest of the large. And it really, it's amazing that it so happens that the smallest space, which you call Planck's dimension, uh, that's where, that's nature's unit of measurement. That's where uh, dimension stops, nothing lower than Planck's dimension. And the, uh, the universe, of course, is 10 to 27 centimeter uh, large, which is to give you some idea, we, we human are about the mid-size between the largest of the large and the smallest of the small. So we may be tiny, but uh, if you look into uh, the reality of the whole entire system, we happen to be about the mid-size between the smallest of the small and the largest of the large. And um, so getting back to the paradigm change, uh, as I mentioned to you that we found out that electrons really are not little solid marble particle, they're actually a wave packet acting as a particle. So if it's a wave, we have to describe it by a wave equation. Then this is a plot of the uh, real part of this real and imaginary numbers, real part of the wave equation. So if you have a wave equation, you have to describe it with a wave what you call wave function. And then, of course, you have to use not Newton's laws of uh, classical physics, but uh, quantum laws of motion, which Schrodinger equation looks a little clumsy, messy, but uh, it does give the good risk. It shows that uh, electrons are stable inside the atom because there's a wave packet under the influence of the proton makes standing wave, just like in a musical instrument. Uh, when you play a guitar, there's a standing wave. You uh, play a flute, there's standing wave. Here in the atom, these uh, wave packets make standing wave patterns like these. This is the hydrogen wave function, uh, the, which is the uh, simplest. You see, when the, these patterns form, then the atom becomes stable. Doesn't electron doesn't fall into the proton. So this is the simplest one. And as we go to higher and higher uh, uh, larger, larger uh, atoms, then we have more atoms, uh, I mean more electrons, more, more uh, neutrons and protons in the center. And uh, now, uh, so this, this, is the, this is the way that we, describe all of the other particles. We'll get to that in a minute. But at least you can see that uh, this, uh, 
the electrons really is a kind of a cartoon de depiction. It's actually standing waves, uh, as you uh, as you saw there. So there are really no. Uh, see. Uh, so similarly, oops. See. Similarly, you you see these uh, marble ball like protons and neutrons. They're really not exactly. It's just a depiction for our perceptual uh, uh, understanding. And again, the course the same way. They're all actually wave packets. And uh, so that was one paradigm change in our thinking. The next one came out, the fam world's famous equation, E equal mc squared, Einstein's most famous equation. I'm sure most of you know about this equation. Energy is really mass times the square of the velocity of light, which is the limiting velocity of the universe, uh, universal speed limit. And um, this was unfortunately infamously proved by Hiroshima and Nagasaki, showing that there's no doubt that atom is really full of uh, uh, just a packet of energy. And now we have to go a little farther because these electrons going around, simple hydrogen, for example, moves with a velocity about one hundredth of the speed limit of the universe, a velocity of light. And so in the, uh, in the more complicated atoms, actually inner electrons go almost two-thirds of the speed of the light. So you have to correct for this equation using Einstein's theory of relativity. And uh, when you do that, then you come, come, come up with this little complicated formula. But you see, there's a mass term here. And this one doesn't have a mass, but, but the momentum. But that's, for example, in the photon, the, the packets of light that's coming from you to my eye, and you can see these actually don't have any mass. We know that photon travels with velocity of light. It doesn't have mass. So how does it have energy? Because of this term here, it, uh, this momentum gives its energy. So we have to use relativity with quantum mechanics to really describe the atom uh, more correctly. And at the beginning, there a lot of work was going on. The person who actually solved this was Paul Dirac. Um, and I had an opportunity of meeting him when I was a student, because I was a student of S.N. Bose, so, uh, of the boson fame. The name that he was given, bosons, was actually by Dirac. So when I was a student of uh, Bose in 1952, he came, to, he came to Calcutta. And this is a little faded picture, but very dear to me. So I'm just going to show you that uh, the, uh, uh, just sort of nostalgic. <laughs> um, so Dirac actually solved for the first time an equation that combines special relativity with quantum mechanics. And the result was a more accurate description of these energy levels and so that was actually what you're looking for. This is a, one of the, again, most elegant uh, equation, but it's sort of written in the physicist's shorthand. This, uh, this uh, Dirac operator here, D slash, actually is a big, long expression. Physicists know when you see that sign what it means. Um, so this is Dirac's theory for the electron. Now, of course, what Dirac set out to do to find the uh, relativistic effect on the motion of the electrons, he found that. But he was surprised that instead of two equations, he found only up with four equations. And that was big, very puzzling. What are the other two, four other two equations are saying, telling us? 
It turns out that um, to, after two years of proposing many, many theories, we stumbled across something totally new that changed our paradigm again. And what he found that those two other equations actually belong to antiparticles. It seems that electron, uh, the electron has an antiparticle, which is we call positron. So the two extra equations in Dirac's uh, theory, they actually are describing, they're showing that matter is actually uh, uh, has every particle has an antiparticle, and what happens when they come together? They destroy each other, and energy comes out like a photon. So, um, conversely, if you uh, put energy enough energy, then you get a, a positron and a uh, an electron also. So, if particle is not stable, what is stable then? Well, you've got one pointer, is that no matter where you create the electron in the universe, they have exactly the same property. Where or when you create is still exactly the same property. And so, uh, naturally led to the paradigm change of our thinking, that there is a field, continuous field, that fills that fills all space and time throughout this old universe. And uh, they have not changed since the beginning of time. And so uh, that's how we came to what we call quantum fields. The classical field you are aware of, this like the, our, uh, our classical gravity, which you do not see, you cannot touch, but it's spinning you down on your seat. But it, try to get up, then you would feel it. We go every day without even thinking about it. But it is unseen, untouched. Uh, you cannot touch it, but it's still there. But the quantum fields are, have a similarly abstract, no structure, uh, no, you cannot see any form to it. But they have their own source. Earth's gravity has its, uh, Earth is its source. But in, the, in terms of uh, the quantum fields, they have their own source. And also, classical gravity is stable, but quantum gravity is always fluctuating, always fluctuating since the beginning of the universe. And it, everything has changed, but those fluctuations, the pattern of it, it is spontaneous, unpredictable, and always active. And there are many, many of them happening all the time. And uh, that seems like a good source for manifestation manifestation of this uh, of the universe and uh, so the quantum fields and I, I'm just uh, summarizing them the, every particle have their uh, antiparticle and the uh, and they all uh, are uh, uh, particles can be created and destroyed so we came up with this idea of the uh, quantum field theory that's that is the most intricate and yet most meaningful uh, uh, discovery, the paradigm change or discovery that has happened in recent times. In the last 50 years or so, it has been developed. And so we have a standard model of elementary particles from the quantum field. So there, every particle has a quantum field, like uh, electrons, uh, uh, electrons has uh, its own field, uh, neutrino has its own field, up quark, down quark. So these are all uh, called uh, quarks, and these are the leptons. They have their own fields, each one of them. And then we have the gluon, uh, which is the strong force. Then photon is our carrying the electromagnetic energy. And these are in, uh, small. Uh, uh, these are very small dimension, their uh, interaction length. But nevertheless, they exist. And then, of course, the Higgs, Higgs boson. So we classify them according to their so-called spin. And uh, so we have a complete model of these elementary particles that have been discovered. And all of them has exactly the, uh, uh, fits in very beautifully with this theory. And so uh, that theory happens to be very, very long. 
even in physics it's shorthand it's a pretty complicated but uh, you see here these are uh, the, these are for weak field this for uh, photon field then we have the Higgs field then we have the uh, uh, lepton fields and then the quark fields and this is a gluon field so all of them all the interactions are encoded in this one equation and uh, if you really want to get into it you probably have to spend a whole career in <laughs> quantum physics in university but uh, um, fortunately you don't have to go to it uh, but get the message what it is trying to tell us the, uh, in science, as you know, it is open-ended. We, we know that quantum field theory of the standard model is established, but it is not the end. It, 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 it doesn't have gravity, it doesn't have uh, dark matter, dark energy, and maybe some other things. But at least in its own sphere, it will be always true, just like Newton's law. It's always true when the velocity is small, when the gravity is weak, but if you go to stronger gravity or very uh, uh, very large, very large velocity, then of course uh, 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 the uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, this, this standard model has to be modified. Uh, exactly, we don't know yet how it will be, but at least we have room for it. But no matter what happens, just like Newton's law has a has remained true, the standard model will remain, the, remain, remain to be so. Now, now next paradigm change is that all of these fields that you saw, all of these particles, they all come from one source. What we have done is we, have, we cannot go to very high temperature, but we can go to, uh, we can utilize our theory to determine what would happen at higher, higher and higher temperature. So if you do that, we find very interestingly that the strong force strength come down and uh, the electromagnetic force can, uh, strength become higher. So eventually, at a high energy, they actually become one. And if you go a little farther down, then gravity will be united also. This is the most cutting edge uh, area of research now, how to find unification of all the forces and particles. And, uh, so you see uh, at the very fabric of space at uh, uh, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, as I mentioned, they, all the forces and the particles e eventually unite. So now imagine this to be true exactly. It fills all space and time throughout the universe. How big is the universe? It's very hard, it's beyond our perception actually, but we know the uh, Andromeda Nebula, which is our which is Andromeda Galaxy actually, which is our closest neighbor. But even that is two and a half million light years away. Light travels at the speed of uh, 186,000 miles per second. So from, from Earth to Moon, it takes only one second and one. It's, it's time to go from here to there. If you, uh, if just to go around the world one time, it's only tenth of a second, just flick, flicker of an eye. At the speed, can you imagine two and a half million years, the whole time that we have been uh, evolving from homo habilis to human, this light is only reaching our very first galaxy. And there are two trillion of these galaxies in our visible universe. And so immensely vast, but all of this space, is filled with these quantum fields bearing the blueprint of all creation and also their activity is very similar to our basis of uh, uh, awareness that it is, it is actually providing the impetus for our evolution and nature allows uh, evolution of all the possibilities. For example, in, in, on this earth, 99.9% .9 of the species that ever lived has been already extinct. We are the product of this uh, evolution and naturally we are the dominant species. And so we can really think about not only the, science, the same science that has given us technology, we live in a global technological society now, 
the same science is telling us that uh, uh, the whole universe is filled with this quantum field and they're fluctuating. Uh, they're fluctuating. This is a slow motion description. If you go to uh, uh, higher speed, uh, it'll be almost blurry. It's really fortunate that universe has spared us from, uh, from uh, perceiving this. But nevertheless, it is there. You can see all the effects through our uh, experiment and the measurements. And uh, this is to show that this fluctuation is exactly everywhere throughout the universe, uh, no matter where you are, where you are not, and uh, always active. And uh, this is, we are in that sense, of the uh, in a manifestation of uh, this uh, uh, spontaneous activity of the universe, which is uh, creating all the manifestation, uh, uh, leading to our existence, and still controlling and uh, uh, upholding our our life and our manifestation. And I just want to finish by pointing out to you that. Uh, uh, it's early to uh, see that how similar this is to our ancient Vedic wisdom. Uh, in Sanskrit we say Sarvam Kalidam Brahma. Brahma, the uh, formless source, exists being intertwined inseparably with everything. You, me, all the particles, everything is come from one source. And we, are in, we are intertwined, inseparable in our existence with that. And that is a, something that we do not think about it, but eventually, as we evolve, that would, I, th I think that paradigm would really uh, give us uh, a good understanding of what, what we are and what's our place in the universe. And uh, uh, also, obviously, this is Aham Brahmasmi Tattvamasi. I am the source. Uh, in, in, in inseparable part of the source, and so are you. So everything else in this world are interconnected at its deeper level. And this is a connotation that eventually will help him evolving in our brain as it has helped technology that is that really has made our lives so much easier today. So in effect, this um, knowledge that our this is God was through contemplations of many millennia. It's really strange to think that that knowledge, that the description that they gave of our, our uh, origin, where we fit in in this universe, is so really similar to what we're finding through science. Isn't that interesting? With that, I, I, I uh, would finish my talk. Thank you.